less energy efficient the household is, the higher the bill is. A two bedroom apartment with an FRG rating would have a rough annual cost of somewhere in between two and a half to three thousand euro to keep the lights on and keep warm every year. That's almost three to four times the fuel allowance. And then as the house increases in size, so does the heating cost. So a three bed semi D with a low energy efficiency rating could cost between three and a half and four thousand to heat. So if we look at the different types of heating fuel used, we can see that a higher proportion of homes with the lowest energy ratings use things like coal, smokeless fuel, peat, water, and solid multi-fuels. These are high emitters of greenhouse gases, and they have a serious effect on air quality. According to the latest SEAI Energy in Ireland report, CO2 emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels account for 57% of Ireland's total greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, it's a considerable figure. So we need to do something about it. What do we do? We make our homes more energy efficient. Energy efficient homes help reduce our carbon footprint as they require less fuel to heat. And obviously they would bring down bills. But despite two government strategies specifically aimed at tackling energy poverty, barriers persist to accessing grants for low-income households. And these are the households, as we can see, who are most likely to use solid fuels, such as coal and peat, and the people who are more, again, more likely to be in the, the, the higher BER ratings. Um, these are the households, though, that the policy should be targeting, but it's the upfront costs that are associated with accessing sustainable energy grants can act as a barrier for those on low income. Investment in renewable energy and retrofitting of a scale required to meet our national climate ambition requires large scale investment in our infrastructure. For instance, an upgrade of the national grid must be a key element of that infrastructure investment so that communities, cooperatives, farms and individuals can produce renewable energy and sell what they don't use back to the national grid, thus becoming self-sustaining and contributing to our national targets. So incentives and tax structure must look at both the short and long term costs of different population segments and eliminating energy poverty and protecting people from energy poverty should be a key pillar of any just transition platform. A state-led retrofitting scheme is required, especially to ensure social housing and anybody in poor quality housing has access. Zan Aktia, Friends of the Eucharist, we are an environmental justice uh, organization and social justice principles are at the core of our work. And um, as I said, energy poverty is a relatively new topic for us, but um, I feel it's become very evident that it is unavoidable to work on it. Uh, if we want to truly adv advocate for climate justice on a local level. And um, social and human rights, especially in the light of the climate crisis, are inseparable from the right to a healthy environment. Um, so in this kind of context where th there is no real actually support from the state and basically the system, uh, people here are used to self-organize and to help uh, their community. We have um, identified households in, the, in this area who haven't had electricity uh, for a number of years and even decades. And um, we basically wanted to run a campaign uh, which would have a concrete positive impact on, on the local community, while also raising awareness on energy poverty and um, advocating for real solutions like uh, locally sourced energy, uh, solar energy. Uh, it's, uh, the preparation actually took a whole year uh, before the campaign was launched in February last year. And uh, we decided to try out a crowdfunding campaign for the first time ever. Um, and we set our goal at raising uh, from the public um, 13,500 euro uh, for five households um, in the central Croatia area, as I mentioned, to bring them electricity with solar panels. And um, I have to say that the crowdfunding was not only successful, but we managed to exceed our goal and we were able to cover six households in, in the end, while also one company that um, specializes in solar um, <clears throat> energy donated the se seventh solar system. So I guess in short, a well-planned communication strategy, both on, on social media and traditional media is very crucial because crowdfunding campaigns are a slippery slope. 
And I think one important lesson learned um, is definitely that you need to balance the campaigning narrative uh, with the sensitivity of the situation. Uh, meaning that a lot of people in extreme energy and general poverty live in, in very bad conditions and oftentimes they're ashamed of how, how they live and they don't want to be exposed. And uh, I think this is especially important for us, uh, those of us who are campaigners to keep in mind uh, when we're uh, talking about also including impacted people in our campaigns and giving them spotlight, uh, etc., and that we don't, you know, basically use them just to raise the profile of the uh, campaign and issue. So for us within the traveler community and the traveler popu population, uh, like generally energy poverty is an, is an issue. But for, for the thousand families who live in mobile homes, it's an acute issue. And, and back in 2018, um, we did a study in, into energy poverty amongst travelers living in mobile homes. And we found that uh, about 77% of families were in energy poverty. And families on average spent about 108 euros a week on fuel. And that's compared with an average spend in the general population of around 40 euros per week. And so with the general population, they, people spend around 4% of their income. But for families living in, in mobile homes, that was 25% of their income. So we know the kind of indicator of energy poverty is around 10%. For those, you know, those families, they were at 25% of their income. It, we were, I was asked to speak about a just transition. And for that group of families, um, we, can, we can advocate and say there needs to be a just transition for travellers. But how do you target the most vulnerable? And what, what do we have to do differently to enable people who don't have resources to, 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 to choose greener energy per, per se? And um, I would say, like in terms of um, what we have to do differently. We have to include the people experience energy poverty in any actions that were taken around moving towards a just transition. And then we, I, I suppose the state has to target its resources specifically at those with the, that are in the highest rates of energy poverty. So in terms of travellers, um, travellers living in mobile homes are, are one group, but across the board, travellers in general, for me when we were asked to speak tonight it was for me it's about what are the mechanics of a just transition you know even in terms of nationally in recent budgets there have there has been a lot of money actually towards retrofitting which is really good and some of that has been allocated for social housing but within that there was no specific allocation for traveler specific accommodation within that and so if that group of people are the most energy poor how do we do that further calculation of what is the best way of targeting that to the people that are, are in the highest levels? You know, you, you raise awareness with individuals about making choice about, you know, to live greener. But when you're in poverty, you don't have that choice because the systems that define where you live and how energy is provided to you, you know, your access to resources to, to have somewhere warm to live, you don't control any of that. It's, everything is, is outside of your control. So I suppose the point earlier that I was trying to make is the state needs to play a central role in saying there's a group of people in our society that we don't have to convince, we have to provide for 